Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Hall of Famer Bob Baird ruled Milwaukee's airwaves in the 60s and 70s. He spoke with countless musicians and celebrities over the years. Bob collected remarkable recordings of these encounters, which he's now sharing with the public. Here's Bob. Here's a summertime podcast. This group had a hit with the song Theme from a Summer Place. Tony Vitello was the lead singer of the group, The Letterman. He started out performing in a boys' choir, then became the singing voice of Peter Pan in the Disney animated film. When he was a teenager, he performed in a quartet, The Foremost, which included singer-actress Connie Stevens. The Letterman had many hit records, including their first, The Way You Look Tonight. If you were at the 1970 WOKY Pops Festival at County Stadium, you saw the Letterman in person. Tom? Hello, Mr. Bob Berry. Yes, speaking. Tony Butala, Letterman, long distance. Hello, Tony. How you doing? Good. Uh, I guess the last time I saw you was at our uh, Pop Festival uh, at yeah. County Stadium. Yeah, I'm sending you another one this year. Yeah, right. Is it on uh, yet or is it... June 13th. Oh. Is coming up, so we're, we're getting close. Yeah, well, you know... Uh, it's too bad. Uh, last time we just played the Waldorf and, uh, and the Palmer House in Chicago in opposite times. But this year we're playing the Palmer House first in Chicago, and then we go to the Waldorf. Who are we going to have this year? Uh, so far we've got uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, uh, Lobo, Bread, and Rare Earth. Oh, uh-huh. Those are the only four that we've announced up to this time. Uh-huh. That was yeah. a lot of fun last time. We met a lot of nice people and uh, enjoyed ourselves very much. Yeah, the, uh, the audience is uh, very responsive to you, too. Wish we were a little and, closer uh, to them. That's only yeah, yeah, right. That's, that's true. I feel like uh, getting our... See, we have these uh, cordless microphones uh, that, that we use occasionally, and uh, we, had, we, we had, had not had them with us uh, that time because, you know, uh, some of the guys flew up and some of the guys drove up. But if we had them, we would have uh, probably just jumped off the stage and walked out into the crowd. That's you, the uh, do you still do a lot of concert work? Yeah, oh, sure. Um, not as much as it used to be because we were out of our minds doing concert work. It reminded me, uh, this last week's Billboard, the Chicago published their schedule in the Billboard, mm-hmm. and uh, looking at their schedule reminds me of what ours was like about three or four years ago, like every night or something. And you can only do that for so many amount of years, you go nuts, you know. Well, did you do a lot of things at the stadiums uh, at that time, uh, like you did here? We, very, no, no, we'd never been uh, big enough. Uh, whenever a Beatles or, you know, where that uh, fanatic thing happens where we can sell out football stadiums and things, but uh, we do, the promotions that we do are downtown auditoriums maybe capacity of four or 5,000, you know. But uh, we've done, when we do colleges, we do a lot of concerts at colleges where they wouldn't they'd sell tickets to the college students, big universities where we do football field things. Uh, like, for example, Auburn, Alabama, we performed in the middle of their football stadium and uh, same thing with Penn State. Uh, we're talking to Tony Batello right now, and uh, he's, of course, with the Letterman, and uh, many of you saw him here at uh, County Stadium uh, last year for our pop festival. And uh, Tony's in uh, Chicago with uh, Jim and Gary Pike, the other two members of the Letterman, and they're performing at the uh, Palmer House. You had an unusual guest there the other night. Uh, was it Tarzan? Uh, oh, yeah, Johnny Weissmiller. Johnny Weissmiller, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, well, he was a lot of fun. But talk about a guy that's in shape. <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> hey, for his age, I mean, he's coming. He's making pictures in the 20s. Yeah. And uh, he's in better shape than Jim, Gary, and myself put together. <laughs> Oh, he's a big guy, anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had, had a little reception afterwards uh, for us, the Capitol Records did after the show, and uh, he came up uh, to the reception, and we sang a little four-part harmony. And I can't remember now if you guys wrote uh, any material. I've written things. Uh, Jerry and Jim, I don't believe, ever written wrote anything. Uh, I have a stack of about two or 300 songs that I've written, <laughs> but I've never written anything good enough for the, for the other two guys to want to record. <laughs> but, you know, we travel so much like we have been doing. Writing, to me, even if you have a little bit of ability, you have to have a perseverance to sit down and write a lot of things in order to start writing well. And uh, we just don't, don't have the inclination. There's so many great songs written by so many great writers we have at our disposal. Uh, it doesn't make sense for us to take time out to sit down to write. What do you feel is the uh, tops of uh, the writers right now? Well, I, you know, as far as consistency, a guy that has written a more variety of things, uh, I think Burt Bacharach, uh, maybe he's... Of course, people don't uh, realize Hal David is very responsible for that team. But a lot of people I've heard say back records things all sound the same, but they don't to me. And he has a track record. Of course, you know, he took up right after Mancini, 
start you know, way back, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Of course, I don't think you can surpass Lennon and McCartney with the amount of commercial trends that they've started in their writing. Uh, but I think they're amongst the, the top. Of course, Elton John, here's another one just came along. He's writing a lot of uh, things that are, are contemporary that people identify with right now. What was your uh, biggest hit? The biggest hit in the amount of sales <laughs> was Going Out of My Head Medley. Uh, it was in 67 and early part of 68. And uh, one reason it was because of sales is because there's more record buyers now. But The Way You Look Tonight and When I Fall in Love were our two biggest as far as uh, positions on the chart. Both of them got in the top three in the nation. But the, in those days, you could get to the top three without selling as many records. Right. We only sold, I think, uh, seven, eight hundred thousand of each of those. But, uh, a lot going of records. On, right, going out of my head, sold 950-some thousand copies. We were only about 50,000 short of having a gold record. Oh, gee. And hey, we, everybody we, go out and buy the record right uh, now. <laughs> the Letterman have yet to have a gold single. As many hits as we've had over the period of time, we've never had a gold single. Of course, we have many gold albums, but I uh, imagine that people, when their single's out, they know that they'll wait a month or two and it'll be out on an album. Yeah, <laughs> the right. Album. Whose idea was it to get into these medleys? I know you did a few of them. You did uh, Love is Blue and, uh, and then Going Out of My Head, Can't uh, Take My Eyes Off You. And then we did a medley of two uh, Boston Nova type things on that same album, the live album. Mm -hmm. Well, the medley thing came around. Of course, remember what's his name? Uh, uh, the Detroit Wheels and uh, Mitch Ryder. Mm -hmm. he, he did medleys, the fast ones together, uh, about five, six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have any idea that uh, Going Out of My Head would be a single release. We just, in person, uh, for in your act, uh, medleys go over real well, of like Gershwin tunes, or we do a medley in our act of our McCartney Leonard things. And uh, people love these things in a, on a club floor in a concert. So that was just uh, two tunes that we were working on as single individual tunes, and we just happened to put the going on the head down. We had a sheet music on a piano, and we were working it up. The next tune just happened to be Can't Take My Eyes Off You. And our piano player, Wilson Brown, started playing his chord progression, and it, we said, wait a minute, that's the same type of chord progression that's on the tune before, so let's put it together as a medley. We put that together as a medley for a person, the live album came out, and the couple disc jockeys throughout the country start lifting that cut out of the live album and start playing it like a single because they start getting requests for it. And that forced Capitol to put it out as a single record. So our biggest single sales-wise was actually an accident. How did you uh, put your unique uh, harmony together? Uh, to, how, do, how does a group do this? Well, I think one secret, maybe I shouldn't be telling my secrets, but... <laughs> of the group, but one secret is we don't have a tenor and we don't have a bass. And uh, there's three of us that have the same range, and Jimmy and Jerry Pike are both blessed with falsettos, which is a, you know, a Frankie Daly type sound way up high. Mm -hmm. So being that the three of us have thick, middle-range voices, you've got to have more of a blend than a tenor trying to blend with a bass. You understand? It's like yeah. a, a tuba trying to blend with a piccolo, mm -hmm. whereas you have uh, three trumpets, there's a natural blend. So that's our vocal chords are in comparison to like three guys that have trumpet type resonances and trumpet type qualities so we have to have a thicker sound but the only thing when we get in trouble is when we have a, some high parts where one of the guys will just switch into a falsetto and that's probably one of the secrets very good we strain a lot but we have a better blend <laughs> <laughs> hey, one, one more question Tony uh, you don't have to answer this one if you don't want to but we've been doing a little check of entertainers and we started out with uh, disc jockeys and there's a uh, disc jockey in Honolulu, Hawaii who is making $400,000 a year. Can you imagine that? $400,000 a year. And so we wondered, uh, what entertainers make? They're, they're on the road all the time, and they're making records. Uh, what what kind of a range? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give, I can give you a range. Uh, it depends on some years. It can fluctuate quite a bit in this business. But I'll tell you, uh, uh, the Letterman have grossed uh, with record sales and, and uh, in-person appearance uh, monies. We, the Letterman have grossed over a million dollars for three years in a row now. Mm, fantastic. Now, that doesn't mean each one of us uh, right, get that. Yeah. Uh, it's the corporation Letterman. Right. And then, then uh, by the time the agents and uh, whatnot get down, we, we make a dollar three years. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, you know, when you make a record, you don't get all the money from that record. Uh, or when you make an appearance. Uh. No. Uh, personal appearances uh, are a good, uh, a little more than half of the money that we make. Uh, and then the records are the same. One depends on the other. If you have more hit records, the more uh, jobs you, you get. Uh, and if you, and the more jobs you get, the more exposure you give your records. And the more people see you will go out and buy your records. So it's a vicious circle if you do a good show. And that's the 
thing we've, for the last 10 years, we've strived with is our group to never sell an audience spot, to try our hardest at every personal appearance because you never know when the hit records are going to stop. If yeah. you want to make a name for yourself for the type of show you do, whether you have hit records or not. Well, and, yeah. and that philosophy has gotten us through the lean periods of when we, between hits, you know, we've gotten those like a year and a half or two between big hits. Tony, thank you very much. Uh, Tony Vitara from the, uh, the Letterman. Out of my Thank you for listening to Bob Berry's Unearth Interviews. Be sure to subscribe and rate our podcast on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find all the episodes at wisconsinbroadcastingmuseum.org. Check out Bob Berry's book, Rock and Roll Radio Milwaukee. Book sale proceeds support Angels Kids Fund and Donate Life Wisconsin. The preceding program was made possible by a generous contribution from Terry Bond.